Hi guys, again, this is Professor Brian Ives Areneta. Uh, I'm back to give you a crash course in environmental science to complete this four-part ecology series. Okay, now it's time to look at the whole picture. I have introduced you already to the concept of interconnectedness in lecture one. And the study of the interaction between humans and their own environment is called environmental science. Humans depend on their environment for food, water, air, shelter, and other resources. We have here the different spheres of this planet, and uh, we are living in it. So we can really be constructive or destructive in various ways. Okay, review the Earth's layers. Take note that we are only living in the crust. That's less than 1% of the total volume of the Earth. And we are only living on the outermost skin of, let's say, an apple. And to think that we are inhabiting only about 10% of the land surface, if you include the waters, if we have 30% land, then we are only occupying 0.003% of the total surface of the Earth. The crust on average is about 30 kilometers thick, but of course, depending whether you are in the seafloor or in mountain tops, that's how the thickness can vary. The crust is part of the biosphere, and this is the only layer that makes that much sense in ecology. But if we also look at the other larger layers here, like the mantle, just imagine how much resources it can supply or will supply to the crust in the future. There is unlimited energy there too. So imagine if we can just stop the heat and create geothermal plants all around the country. Okay, we can get free electricity for life. We can use that to supply unlimited internet, to power your, let's say, maglev trains, to run our factories, to grow food. Again, energy is everything, and the Philippines has infinite energy underneath it. These are the layers of the atmosphere, and uh, we have this gas composition. Take note that as you go up the altitude, the gases become less dense, but you still retain the same proportions of 78% nitrogen, 29% oxygen, and so on. Now only ozone or O3 is not constant because there is that part in the atmosphere where it is in very high concentration. I call that the ozone layer. That's about 20 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And uh, we all know what ozone is. Okay, Most organisms on Earth depend on the ozone layer because, again, UV radiation can damage DNA and it can cause mutations. Without it, there would be um, no life on this planet. In uh, contrast, some gases in the atmosphere direct energy towards the Earth's surface. Now, energy from the sun reaches the Earth's surface as light, but it can leave the surface as heat. Some gases in the atmosphere function to radiate this heat back towards the Earth's surface. The atmosphere's ability to trap heat in this way is called the greenhouse effect. The atmospheric gases, of course, that contribute to this effect are called your greenhouse gases. And the concentrations of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane here, they affect the amount of the sun's seat that is being trapped by the atmosphere. As seen in this picture, we have wind and heat that drives the dynamics in the ocean, meaning the waters here are in constant motion, evaporation, then precipitation, for example, we have winds that stress the water in the nor northern hemisphere that results to the so-called Ekman transport here, okay, creating movement together with your Langmuir circulation. Here on the right, we have the uh, interaction between the atmosphere and the oceans. You can see ice here and the albedo. Albedo refers to how solar radiation is being reflected back to the atmosphere. So... The whiter the ice, it reflects it back to the atmosphere. So you also have your entrainment and upwelling. Again, all of these are physical processes that keep the oceans in motion so that the nutrients, currents, and heat are distributed, uh, well distributed to support life. The spinning of the earth, the uh, geological oscillations, and all sorts of agitation actually works to prevent the uh, stagnation of these systems. The geosphere exchanges materials with the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and your biosphere. 
Recall that photosynthetic organisms take carbon from the atmosphere and incorporate it into their living tissues. After the organisms die, some of the carbon may become, let's say, coal or oil. And thus they enter the ge geosphere. Okay, sulfur, phosphorus, and other elements also cycle between the biosphere and the geosphere. Remember your biogeochemical cycles like your carbon cycle, water, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycles. Actually, if you examine the composition of every living organism, it is somewhat similar to the Earth's crust, where we came. Organisms are basically a result of energy transformations, with the sun, of course, as the primary source, and the raw materials coming from the crust. Okay, now let's have biodiversity that refers to the variety of forms of life in an area. This collage is simply an understatement. There are more than 8 million known species in this planet. Okay, what more if we include the unknown and um, maybe uh, the things that we will engineer in the future, new species. Of course, uh, we know that speciation is an evolutionary process and it takes a lot of time, but who knows, we can also hasten evolution. Now, one measure of biodiversity is species diversity. Species diversity, in turn, is reflected by both species richness and species evenness. Species richness uh, refers to the number of unique species within an area. And this kind of diversity is easiest to notice and uh, is most often what is meant when we refer to the term biodiversity. But uh, there is another... Um, a uh, measure called species evenness, which refers to the relative number of individuals of each species in an area. Now, species evenness is uh, quite harder to study than species richness, but uh, it is also important to understanding ecosystems. For example, you have two reefs. Two reefs may have the same species richness, yet they differ in species evenness. For example, suppose that uh, 20 coral species live in two reef areas. In one area, the numbers of each kind of corals are about the same. But uh, in the other one, only three dominant coral species are present in large numbers. And there are very low representatives on or for the other species. Okay, so you can actually have that difference. And disruptions in the reef can affect the two ecosystems differently despite the idea that they are comparable in terms of species richness. Another measure of biodiversity is genetic diversity or the amount of variation in the genetic material within all members of a population. In this picture, I believe these are cichlids, the most common example of genetic uh, variety or variability in fishes. Now, genetic diversity is important because it affects a population's ability to adapt in the face of an environmental change. Recall that evolution by natural selection acts upon genetic variation within populations. Now, when populations are reduced to small numbers, the amount of genetic variation is reduced for many generations to come. And a reduction in uh, a species' genetic uh, uh, variation also reduces the likelihood that the species will survive uh, natural selection. If you recall the perils of small populations, that also include reduced genetic diversity. And uh, of course, when in inbreeding occurs, bad genes are also expressed. Uh, biodiversity provides important benefits to people. For example, thousands of plants and animal species can serve as food. Uh, of course, you don't want to eat the same species of cultured fish, don't you? We always prefer variety. In the case of fisheries, uh, biodiversity ensures sustainability, ecosystem stability in high production zones like estuaries, and coral reefs rely on a complex interaction between a variety of species. Uh, removing one keystone species or a group of organisms that have an important ecological role will eventually result in the destruction of these productivity areas with economic value. Trees provide wood for homes and fuel. Microbes have a lot to offer too. Now many species are sources of medicines and useful chemicals, 
and a lot of undiscovered species may someday supply other resources and benefits. Ecosystems also recycle human wastes, including carbon dioxide. We don't want fewer species around us, but it seemed like uh, we are accelerating the extinction of the other species. So, having said all of this, let's look at the usual issues. As the human population increases, so does the human impact on the environment. Alright, ozone thinning. Ozone in the lower atmosphere is harmful. But ozone floating 20 kilometers above Earth is a zone called the stratosphere. Uh, it shields the planet surface from harmful ultraviolet radiation or UV light. Unfortunately, several kinds of human-made chemicals contribute to the destruction of the ozone layer. The most important of these are your chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. Damage to the ozone layer led most countries to stop producing CFCs in the 90s. And we have uh, environmental scientists actually estimated that it will take the ozone layer about 50 to 100 years to recover completely. The effort to protect the ozone layer shows that scientists, uh, the public, and the policymakers can work together to solve environmental problems. Uh, it was, however, observed in a recent study that the size of the Antarctic ozone hole has declined by half the size of the uh, continental U.S. between uh, 2000 and 2015. So, uh, the ozone layer is um, sort of expected to fully heal uh, sometime between uh, 2040 and 2070. Now, aside from ozone thinning, we are also suffering from air pollution. In many urban areas, the air is visibly polluted with smog, okay, water vapor that's mixed with chemicals that result from human activities. And these activities can include, of course, burning your fossil fuels and using chemicals in vehicles, homes, and industries. What about global warming? Scientists have noticed a relationship between average levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the average global temperatures. So as carbon dioxide levels have increased, so have your temperatures. These are the indicators of a warming world. So it's obvious. Ice will melt, we will have sea level rising affecting the coastal areas. Disruptions in temperatures can also create low pressure zones and typhoons. On the right, we have coral bleaching. When water is too warm, corals will expel the algae or your, the, those zooxanthellae that I have mentioned in my previous videos. These corals will expel these organisms, leaving in their tissues, causing the coral to turn completely white. Now, when a coral bleaches, of course, it's not dead. But uh, corals can survive a bleaching event, but... Uh, of course, they are under more stress and they are subject to mortality because they also de uh, depend their nutrition on this zoosanthellae. I have something in mind actually about carbon dioxide. Even if it's not in the atmosphere, it can still cause the so-called warming. Now, if carbon dioxide is converted to organic compounds inside living organisms by photosynthesis, and if these organic compounds are metabolized, the chemical reaction produces heat. Right? So think of all living organisms producing heat every day. From plants to animals to humans, microbes. Actually guys, uh, global warming is an interesting issue. But we neglect to account the heat produced by all organisms. From bacteria to the blue whale. Uh, yes, uh, carbon dioxide can trap heat as a gas. And it can release heat when trapped inside an organic living thing. Uh, the fossil fuels we have are also organic in origin. So when we use them, we also release heat and more carbon dioxide. So that's probably the reason why carbon is black in the philosophical sense. It's black. Remember, carbon dioxide cycles between the, the atmosphere and the living things through the processes of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Additionally, carbon dioxide enters the atmosphere when uh, organic matter is burned, such as fossil fuels. So, think again before charging your electronic devices. Uh, they are also producing heat and also use energy from power plants that uses fossil fuels. The number of electronic devices nowadays, I believe it can produce sufficient heat 
to add warm or heat to this planet. Okay, next. Recall that in the uh, global water cycle, water enters the atmosphere as vapor and returns to Earth's surface in the form of precipitation, such as rain or snow. Some air pollutants combine with water in the atmosphere and form acids. The result is precipitation that is acidic or acid, acid precipitation. Because organisms are adapted to the normal pH range of their environment, uh, increased acidity of soil and water causes disease or death uh, to uh, plants and animals. Not to mention, of course, your property damage caused by acidic rain. Human activities can also pollute your land and water by producing waste in the form of sewage and unused materials. Some chemicals enter ecosystems and undergo biological magnification. Uh, I believe you always go for that big fat fish or meat in the dining table. But I assure you, it also has the biggest content share in terms of pollutants like uh, heavy metals, microplastics, and pathogens. These pictures uh, also speak what's on your minds. I know that we are all fully aware of this. But uh, how are we going to find solutions to this? All these problems mentioned so far can lead to what we can call as ecosystem disruption, which is the destruction or substantial change in the functioning of natural ecosystems. Ecosystem disruption is evident as species and sometimes entire communities can disappear. Uh, extinction means the death of every member of a species. Scientists estimate that 20% of Earth species will become extinct in the next 50 years. They call that situation biodiversity crisis. Now, living species have not been lost at such a high rate since the mass extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So most probably, uh, the mass extin extinction currently underway is unique because it is humans that are the primary cause of these extinctions. Now, uh, no one can predict the results of the loss of the millions of species uh, we do know that some species are critical to the functioning of ecosystems. These otters fed uh, heavily on sea urchins, whereas your sea urchins fed on giant kelp that formed the basis of an underwater forest community. Now, when people hunted the otters to near extinction, the sea urchins increased in number, and so they overfed on the kelp, and your entire kelp communities began to disappear. Now, species such as the sea otter that affect many other species in a community are called your keystone species. And extin extinction of the keystone species has serious and sometimes unknown effects on ecosystems. Uh, bivalves here are also keystone species in your mangrove ecosystems. They uh, probably filter the water of debris and heterotrophic microbes uh, to allow more light penetration. Now, overusing resources can also unbalance ecosystems. Until the 1990s, uh, people harvested fish at about the same rate that the fish reproduced. Now, when uh, newer fishing methods brought in larger harvest, the fish populations decreased rapidly and have not yet recovered. An analysis of human impact on ecosystems is known as an e ecological footprint. This analysis accounts for people's use of food and natural resources such as land and water, as well as uh, people's production of wastes and pollution. Let's now turn to possible solutions to these problems. Environmental solutions require worldwide efforts. Scientists, government bodies, and individual citizens must work together to live responsibly within the biosphere. Sometimes it's uh, practical to look at bioindicators so uh, we can plan what to do next. A bioindicator is a living organism that gives us an idea of the health of an ecosystem because uh, some organisms are very sensitive to pollution in their environment. So if pollutants are present, the organisms may change its, uh, let's say, morphology or physiology or behavior, or it could even die. In a discipline called um, 
conservation biology, scientists seek to identify, protect, and manage natural areas that still retain much biodiversity. So conserve what's in there. So where humans have had the largest impacts, your fishing grounds, for example, agricultural areas, former strip mines and drained wetlands or endangered coral reefs, uh, biologists must often devise plans to reverse changes and try to replace missing ecosystem components. So we need to put the word conserve into context. Now, while the changes are not yet that substantial and irreversible, we must do something by repairing, enhancing, and providing more opportunities for healing the system. In uh, restoration biology, scientists deal with extreme cases of ecosystem damage, meaning much is lost already. And that's why you need to replace or restore it. For example, restoring a barren mangrove area via, mang via tree planting activities you, and, uh, and reintroducing native organisms, uh, that's also a way to restore these ecosystems. In this picture, you can also restore corals in the reef or uh, you can replant seagrasses. But it is obvious that even the best scientific efforts may not be able to uh, completely restore an ecological community. But uh, biologists can encourage restoration by applying their understanding of processes, such as understanding energy flows, uh, your species interactions, and of course your biogeochemical cycling. A biodiversity hotspot is a biogeographic region that with um, significant levels of biodiversity that is threatened by human habitation. And the region must meet two strict criteria. First, it must contain at least 0.5% or 1,500 species of vascular plants as endemics. And it has to have lost at least 75% of its primary vegetation. Governments and laws can play a critical role in solving environmental problems. These include le legally protecting endangered species and habitats, or setting aside land for public use, cleaning up pollution, regulating destructive activities, okay, also conducting scientific studies, and encouraging responsible resource use through education and economic incentives. Okay, now this picture is quite controversial. Long ago, uh, people never really fuss about the reality that was Manila Bay. Now that we have this, there goes the activist. You know what I mean. So one thing's for sure, that the government is doing something for the environment here. In some areas, one approach is ecotourism. It's a form of tourism that supports the conservation of ecologically unique areas while bringing economic benefit to local people. Ecotourism in some countries encourage even uh, paying for nature guides and food and lodging in exchange for the opportunity to experience the ecosystem and its unique organisms. Uh, so cooperation between conservation groups, individuals, and uh, governments is crucial in identifying and addressing environmental issues. YouTube influencers and the mainstream media also play an important role in raising awareness of uh, environmental issues uh, but of course some of them really need to review their ecology and uh, general science subjects to uh, sort of prevent them from misinforming the public all right now we're at the end of the line so i'll just leave it now to you guys what can you do to help the environment now there are a few tips here basic tips and uh, the comment section is also open for your suggestions to inform each and every one of us. Again, uh, this is Professor Brian Ives Areneta. Thank you very much for watching. And please don't forget to like and share this video. Thank you very much once again. Bye-bye.